أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا والذين وحبيب قلوبنا وشافينا فوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته طيبين طاهرين معصومين صادقين أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله it's always a pleasure to see all of your faces again and I pray that Allah سبحانه وتعالى accepts all of your ibadah that he accepts all of your tears that he accepts all of your begging and pleading on behalf of Aba Abdullah alayhi salatu wasalam and those who killed the Karbala and that he strengthens his community and makes it increase in Iman and in number, insha'Allah. All praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who when he creates, he doesn't have to seek any counsel. All praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that when he creates, he creates everything perfectly. All praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that when he creates, he takes into account all variables, variables that we can see today, variables that would be present 10 years from now, variables that would be present a thousand years from now. He takes into account all of those things, <clears throat> not as those things come about, but in its own, in the beginning of the creation, he took those things into account. So tonight, inshallah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who when he created man, he created man, and he took into account that man would fall. That man would not listen to the advice that he had given to him. And he also gave, took into account the fact that man would need a way back to himself, so he gave man guidance. He gave man guidance through Adam, through Nu, through Ibrahim, through Musa, through Dawood, through Isa and through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He continued the guidance with Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa salam. And tonight, we celebrate and commemorate the death and the victory of the one who is the inheritor of the prophets and the inheritor of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Aba Abdullah Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wa salam. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how merciful is he? Can we actually quantify or qualify the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Even in our acts of worship, he is so merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us acts of worship that if we do them, we get a great benefit. But if we do the same act of worship in a different way, we get a greater benefit. For example, if you perform salah by yourself, one individual, you get a great benefit from offering the salah. Allah will give you a great reward. But if you call one of your friends and you pray with your friend, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases the benefit exponentially. The more people you pray with, the greater the reward. He's given us the opportunity to pray in our house. He tells us that the whole world, the whole earth, is a place of prostration. And we will get the benefit if we prostrate anywhere in the world. But can we compare if we prostrate ourselves in the masjid? Will we get the same benefit by prostrating in the masjid that we do anywhere else? No, Allah has given us an extra blessing if we prostrate in the masjid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives us the opportunity to make pilgrimage. We could go to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina any month of the year, and we can make visitation. We could perform the umrah. And performing the Umrah is beautiful. 
we get a great reward for it. But when we perform the Hajj, because it's obligatory on us, how many more blessings does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us for visiting the same place, but not visiting the place when we want to visit the place, but visiting the place when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained for us to visit that place. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us an act of worship, and he's increased it in benefits if we do it the way that he wants us to do it. It's unfortunate that many people who want to go to the Hajj don't live in close proximity to Saudi Arabia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knew when he told us in the glorious Quran that he has given us a lifestyle, a way of life that will overtake and supersede every lifestyle that is here. He knew that there were going to be people who lived in America, people who lived in Australia, people who lived in Antarctica, not Antarctica, we have people visit there, but people who live in Alaska, where it may be difficult for them to go to Hajj. So what does he do for us to make it easier for us? If we have parents who weren't able to go to Hajj because they had financial difficulties, can we pay someone to go to Hajj for them? Can we ourselves go to Hajj for them as long as we've completed the Hajj for ourselves? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knew when he created us that this situation was going to present itself. Now when we go to Hajj or we go to Umrah, there's something else that's very beautiful. There's something that we have the opportunity to do while we're there. We have the opportunity to make ziyara. Ziyara is one of the things that many of us as Muslims, we shun away from. Not all of us, but some of us. This whole notion of ziyara, sometimes we look at it, especially when we are not in those places of ziyara, we say, why is it that every time we finish a program, we begin to recite the ziyara, ziyara ashura, ziyara waratha. Why do we recite it? The question shouldn't be, why do we recite it? The question should be, why are those people who say that they follow the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Try to destroy the places of ziyara. Have you thought about that? Last year, for those of you who were here during the Arba'een program, we talked extensively about shaitan. We talked about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, this shaitan is your enemy. Treat him like one. That he is your open and avowed enemy. And it is his job to take you off of the surat al-mustaqeen. Since I was here the last time, shaitan and his minions have been busy. How busy has he been? When he goes and he incites people to bomb the, uh, the shrine of, of, of uh, Sayyid Zainab. When you have them continuously destroying genital, genital baki. When you have, when we go to Hajj and we go to Umrah, these individuals, when we pray, they want to hit us because we bring in turba or they want to try to beat us because we're making ziyarat, we're sending peace and blessings towards the Prophet. These individuals say that they follow the sunnah of Rasulullah, and if they truly follow the sunnah of Rasulullah, then they themselves would not beat us or try to bomb us when we go to visit the holy ones of the household of Rasulullah. They would join us in what it is that we're doing. I find it amazing that in their books that you find where the Prophet says in their books of Ahadith, visit the graves, for visiting them becomes the cause of remembering the next world. But many of those who are not in our school of thought say, if you go to visit the graves, that this is something bad. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in another tradition, my Lord commanded me to come to Baki and ask forgiveness for them. Aisha says, 
the wife of the Prophet, says, I asked Rasulullah, how should one seek forgiveness, to which the Holy Prophet replied, Say, peace, salams be upon the people of this place, from the believers and the Muslims. May Allah have mercy on those who have left and those who are to follow. We should join them soon. Here it is in their books. When Rasulullah is saying to them, saying to Aisha, say assalamu alaikum to the people of Baqi. And for those of us who think that we should only do ziyara towards uh, the Holy, the holy uh, Prophet's family, our Prophet tells us that it's important for you to also do ziyara towards your loved ones too. Why? Because in the tradition, it says to us, Rasulullah would visit the grave of his mother. And he would bring people with him. And when he went to visit the grave of his mother, he would cry. And he would cause those others around him to cry. And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us permission to visit the graves of those who we love. How many of us are actually doing that? When it comes to graveyards, many of us, or many people, especially here in the West, the graveyard is not a good place. The urban legends about the graveyard. If you go into the graveyard, something bad is going to happen to you. This is the place where bad people live. This is the place where evil lives. This is the place where shaitan dwells. But in the school of Ahlul Bayt, the graveyard is far from that. The graveyard is a classroom. The graveyard is a place of reflection. The graveyard is a reminder to us that all of us will taste death and all of us will have to stand up and be held accountable for everything we did towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only that, but the graveyard has been places of inspiration. When a country is going through a bad time, if they're in war, if they're under attack, they go to their graveyards and they begin to tell stories about their heroes and the people that are there, they hear those stories, ordinary people who are not courageous in those graveyards, they look around and they see the people who have become heroes who are ordinary people just like them. They become courageous. They want to stand up. They want to make a stand. For those of us who make the visitation towards Ahlul Bayt, we're not doing it because of the pride of a country. We're not doing it for self-glorification. But what we're doing it for, when we visit those of the Holy, uh, the, of the Prophet's family, we do it because we want to learn from them. We want to take from their example. We want to emulate them. Because if we have the same type of resolve that they had, then perchance, maybe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us the victory in this life and in the hereafter like he had given to those who went before us of the Holy Prophet's household. Salawat. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he, when he chose those individuals who would be our leaders, those people who would do the best for us, those who we, we would need to emulate. When he created this world, he knew that there would be people who would try to destroy those places. He knew that there would be people who would not allow us to go to those places in droves. Think about it this way. If you wanted to make the Hajj, how many people can go to Hajj every year? Less than four million. Not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says no more than four million can come, but the Saudi Arabian government says that we are only going to allow four million this year. Many of you may have had friends who weren't able to make the Hajj because they said we had to do construction in Mecca, so we can only allow 3.5 million people to go to Hajj. Was this ordained by Allah? Or was the shaitan being busy? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that this was going to happen. When the people decided that they were going to tear down the house of Bibi Khadija, 
And they were going to put restrooms there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knew that. When they were going to raise or tear down Jinnah Tubaqi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that they were going to do that. But why are they trying to destroy these places where we do ziyarah? Because hopefully if they can destroy the physical place, they can take out the remembrance of those holy people out of our minds. And take us away from the remembrance of our Lord by doing this. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as Muslims something very special. Earlier I talked about the prayer, how if you pray by yourself, you get a benefit, but you pray with others, it's more of a benefit. If you go to visit Saudi Arabia at any time, you get a benefit if you make Umrah. But if you make the Hajj in Hajj season, you get more of a benefit. The same goes for Ziyarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you make the physical ziyara, for those of you who've gone on the physical ziyara, you know that it's a hardship, but there's something beautiful about it. It changes your life. It changes the way you see the world. It makes you a better person. It makes you a stronger believer, but it also attracts shaitan to come to you and fight against you even harder. But it is a benefit for you to go on ziyara. But what about those who cannot afford the ziyara? What about those who fear for their lives because they're bombing almost daily in certain places of Iraq when you go? Most people don't go to Samara because it's one world in and one world out. And you never know when the bombs are going to come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took into account that so he has given us the opportunity not to get the same blessing of going to Hajj, pardon me, going on Ziyadah physically, but he's allowed us to do Ziyadah any place where we are in this world. We can stand up. We can turn towards our Imams or the Masumin, and we can send salams on them, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us the blessings as if we went. How beautiful is that? How merciful is our Lord? What excuse do we have? Many of us, when it comes down to making the ziyara or reciting the ziyara, we don't think about how important it is. But if we were to take into account the fact that for every day of the week, there's a dua and a ziyara for each of the masumin. Some have their own day. Imam Sahib Asri Razaman on Friday. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on Saturday, so forth and so on. But in these ziyadahs, what is it that we're dealing with when we recite them? If we recite them the way that we're supposed to with understanding, then we have an understanding of why it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made these people great. We have a better understanding of why it is that we should emulate them. But if all we do is stand up and say, peace be upon you, peace be upon you, peace be upon you. I bear witness that, that you did this. I bear witness that you did that. If it just becomes routine to us, it does not penetrate the heart. And if it does not penetrate the heart, it does not give us a benefit. So today, brothers and sisters, I implore you, take the opportunity to learn the ziyaras. Not just to be able to recite them, but to know what it is that's being said and how it is that these ziyarat can help you. We find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us dua. And some people may ask the question, if we have dua, why do we have to do ziyarat? Dua is the conversation that we have between ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's direct communication. There's nothing better than that. You don't have to get in ranks to do dua. You open up your heart. You cry. You tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what you're going through. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he answers your prayer. 
The difference between the dua and the ziyara is, is that in the ziyara you are talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you are imploring someone else to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on your behalf. For those of you who have children, if they have cousins who are close to them or good friends, if they want their friends to come over to the house, they say, look, my mother really likes you. If you ask my mother if I could come to your house, my mother would allow me to go to your house. Why? Because this person has a certain type of intercession with your mother to where you can get what it is that you want. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used men, human beings, perfect individuals to get his message from himself to us, then the question becomes, can't we also use that same vehicle to take the message from ourselves back towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Should that not be the way that we do it? The ziyarat, during this time of the year, during the nights of Ashura, during the nights of Arba'in, we recite ziyarat Ashura every night. Alhamdulillah. Beautiful. But if you're only reciting this dua during this time of the year, you're doing yourself a great disservice. If this is the only time that you recite the ziyara, period, then you're doing yourself a great disservice. Because this ziyara, it gives us strength. It inspires us. It makes us not fall into despair. It keeps us from falling into despondence. We get strong because we see what happened with these individuals. So ziyara itself is a way of communicating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We find that the dua that's taught by the Ahlul Bayt, that we're told that there are certain key points that we must have when we do the dua. That is, that our dua must be heartfelt. We must cry. We must remember others. And we must resolve to do better. The same principles that were put in the dua are also put into the ziyara. So, for those who drop tears when they pray, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees those tears and he answers prayers because of them. We find that the ziyadahs are a, a, a good way of us becoming personally involved with our imams. If you don't know the hardship of the imam, then you may be going through something in your lifetime that you can be helped out with if you knew what the condition of your imam was. Some of you feel like you've been trapped, like you're in a prison, that you're in prison in your own self. Where we have imams that were put in prison for the majority of their lives. Some of us feel like we've been persecuted. We've had imams that have been persecuted. Some of us feel like uh, we're, we're, we're looked at as the worst of society. Our imams went through that too. How did they make it through? What was it that gave them the strength? Do we have what they have? Of course we do. We have the Quran. We have the life of the Prophet. But better than that by itself is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completed it by allowing us to have more guides. Our Prophet said, the first of us is Muhammad, the middle of us is Muhammad, and the last of us is Muhammad. And with, by us saying that all of them are Muhammad, that means that the success that was found by the first of them would also be found in the last of them. That the lifestyle that was good for the first of them is also the lifestyle that was good for the last of them. But many of us, 
The only of the imams that we really know something about is we know about the first three. Two in particular. Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam and Imam Hussein alayhi salam. We know about Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam because many of us, we say that we're in the Jafri school of thought. Some of us know a little about, about Imam uh, Ali Rida alayhi salatu wasalam, especially those of us who come from Persia because we make ziyada to him there. But what about Imam Hadi? What about Imam Musa Qadim? What about these other Imams that we don't mention all the time? What were their life stories? What were their struggles? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw fit to make sure that they too had a day for dua, that they too had a day for ziyara, for us to recite those things. And if we recite them on those days, and if we understood what they went through, how much better would our communities be? But if we only look at these individuals and doing the ziyara as just something that we do on a regular basis without putting any thought into it, then our communities will not grow. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he tells us to do something, there must be a benefit in it. Why is it that we make ziyara? Why do we do visitation towards the imams? towards the Prophet. Number one, because they are the perfect models. Who's better than they are? In every situation, who's better than they are? I had a conversation with one brother and he said to me, he said, you know, in Sahih Bukhari, it talks about the Prophet hitting Aisha. I said, astaghfirullah. Our prophet hit Aisha? He says, yes, he hit her in the chest. I said, okay, no problem. I accept. I'm not going to argue, I accept. I said, but if that's the case, what would cause our prophet to hit a woman, period, anybody? He said, he must have been angry. She must have done something that made him upset. I said, you know, there's a story in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet, do not make those things that are halal for you haram, and do not make those things that are haram for you halal. Do you know the story behind it? The brother said, no, I don't know the story behind it. I said, well, let me give you the story. Two of the wives of the Prophet, I won't call any names, they decided that, you know what, the Prophet goes to see one of his other wives, and she gives him a honey drink. And when he gets that honey drink, he's very happy. So the wives conspired and they said, when the prophet comes home from that wife, we're going to tell the prophet that his breath does not smell good. And we're going to get the prophet to stop drinking the honey drink. So I said, brother, do you know what happened? He said, no. I said, when the prophet came home from his wife's house, the two wives said, we don't like you drinking that honey drink because when you speak to us, it does not smell good. Our prophet, if he was going to be upset about anything, how many of us, if our wives said we, that they want us to stop doing something, we're going to say, okay, I'm going to stop. Really? We don't do that. Even if we know that we need to stop, there's going to be an argument. You can't tell me what to do. I'm the man here. Did our prophet do that? No, our prophet said, if this thing bothers you so much, I'll stop. I said, if our prophet would do that for his wives, what makes you think that he would hit one of his wives? It doesn't compute. It doesn't balance out because our prophet, he always had the best. He said, I've come to perfect your moral character. I've come to perfect your behavior. How can he perfect our behavior if he does bad behavior? There's no one better than our prophet. 
we do the honor to these individuals because they are the ones who love truth. When it comes to the truth, what do all the schools of thought say about the truth and about one individual, one follower of the prophet? They said, Ali is with the truth, and the truth is always with Ali. Some of us were not always the most truthful of individuals. If we're having a problem with telling the truth, then we should make the ziyara of Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us truthful like Ali. They're the best people of nobility. They're the best people of justice. They're the best people of character. They're the best characters of mind. They're the best character of pure thoughts. They're the best characters of cooperation. They're the best individuals for the love of humanity. And they're the best of individuals with perfect virtues. Who is more charitable than Ahlul Bayt? No one. Many of us, if we're asked to give something to a charitable uh, center or organization, we want everyone to know, yeah, I gave this $500 donation. If it's $1,000 or more, we want some type of placket saying, this is what I gave. But when the members of Ahlul Bayt, when they gave, how did they give? They gave in the middle of the night. They gave under a cloak. They didn't want anyone else to know that this is what I'm doing for humanity. They didn't want anybody to come and pat them on their backs. They weren't looking for the glory of individuals. So if we want to become those people that were given charity like they did, we make ziyadah towards them and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us more like them. so that we can be also become the best of individuals. When we do ziyarat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us many blessings. Among those blessings, our Aima, alayhi salatu wa salam, tells us that if we make ziyarat towards the imams and the, the masumim of Ahlul Bayt, that the person who does the ziyarat, his du'as will be answered. At the end of your prayer, when you finish with the tasbih, with the dhikr, after you make du'a, you want that du'a to be answered? Do ziyarat. It will be answered. Not only that, make the ziyarat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive your sins. Make the ziyarat. And it's said that it's like the Holy Prophet himself, alayhi wa salatu if you make visitation towards them, in the hereafter, Rasulullah will make visitations towards you. SubhanAllah. What's better than that? To have Rasulullah come to visit us because we went to visit him and those who he, who, who he informed us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen us to follow? What's better than that? Our Imam said that when we make ziyara towards them, it's the equivalent of making a thousand mustahab hajj. When we make ziyara towards them, it's like making a thousand mustahab umrah. Some people say, well, how is that possible? We have to ask ourselves the question, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just make us 100% flesh and blood? We're 100% what? Human beings. And the human being is made up of spirit, the ruh, and the flesh. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a physical qibla, which is the Kaaba, then what is our spiritual qibla? Our spiritual qibla is Muhammad, Fatima, Ali, Hassan, Hussein, Ali, all the way down to Imam Sahib Asri wa Zaman Ajalallahu to Allah Faraj Shri. So if we make the ziyara, if we look at it 
and say that it's not just about me saying, peace be upon you, but it's about me getting to know you. It's about me having an intimate relationship with you. That means that any time that I find myself in trouble and I want to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I know that I don't have to call towards Allah by myself. I can say, Ya Allah, I made the visitation of your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I know that when the people came to murder him, he called upon you, but he gave him a gift in Ali. He said, for Ali to sleep in your bed. Ya Allah, I don't want Ali to sleep in my bed, but I am in a difficulty like your prophet was in a difficulty. Just like you delivered the prophet, please deliver me. Maybe I'm the one in the bed who is Ali. How does Ali do it? How many of you would be able to sleep in the bed understanding that there are men outside that are coming to kill you that night? How do you sleep? Psychologically, it's impossible. The anxiety will have you so revved up that you won't, that if you hear anything, you jump up. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the sakina upon the heart of Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. He was content. He knew that the life of this world is nothing. The real goal of life is to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we get to that point to we, where we know the real goal of life? We make ziyara towards these people. We get to know who they are. We get to know what they did. We get to know how they did it so that we too can do what they did so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bless us in the way that he blessed them. On a night like tonight, brothers and sisters, I think about a young child who was born as a member of the household of the Prophet. And she was taught in the ways of the household of the Prophet. And brothers and sisters, she lived something in her short lifetime that many of us couldn't even imagine living. This little girl she was the best of the children. We read in the history where Muslim bin Akil went to Kufa and he left his daughter with Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. And on the faithful night that Muslim bin Akil was murdered, he sent his salams to Abba Abdullah. And as he sent his salams to Abba Abdullah, Imam Hussein, he walked over and he patted Muslim bin Akil's daughter on the head. But his daughter Sakina came over and said, you are now my sister. She gave this young lady comfort. But who would comfort her? Brothers and sisters, imagine this little girl, five or six years old, on the day of Ashura, having to look out and see all of her brothers and all of her cousins and her uncles and her Friends of her father go out and die on the plains of Karbala. Imagine this young lady as she looked at her young brother. She saw her father take her brother out to the desert. For those of you who were in Karbala, you know where they went. And you can see Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam as he pleads with the army and says, which of you would just dip your finger in water to give my baby something to drink? When they wouldn't give the baby anything to drink and Imam Hussein was retrieving his baby, they shot the baby through the neck. 
And there was a little girl who was especially hurt by that because this was her baby brother. She was responsible for this child. She made herself responsible for him. Brothers and sisters, after she lost everybody, she saw her father getting ready to go out to war. And she goes and she grabs the leg of the horse of her father. And she says, Baba, don't go. She said, Uncle Abu Fadl, he left and he never came back. She said, Ali Akbar, he left and he never came back. She said, Al Muhammad and Qasim, they went out and they never came back. Father, I know if you go out that you will never come back. She said, oh, my father, can I just lie on your chest one last time? Imam Hussein, he, mounts, he dismounts his horse and he lays down and he allows Sakina to lie on his chest. Sakina falls asleep and she sees her grandmother, Fatima, saying, allow my son to come to me. Brothers and sisters, this is where it gets difficult and this is where the training, this is where understanding what Ziyara does. After the day of Ashura, during the night, you find these evil men, they come and they set fire to the tents. And as they've set fire to the tents, this little girl found herself alone and a man came towards her and he said, I like those earrings that you have in your ears. They will look good in my daughter's ears. This man coolly, he snatches the earrings out of Sakina's ears. Sakina, she begins, she begins to become upset and she says, to someone she passes, she said, can you turn me towards Najaf? And the person said, why do you want to turn towards Najaf? Najaf is too far away for you to walk to. She said, I don't want to go towards Najaf to walk there. I want to complain to my grandfather so he could complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about what's happened to my father and his family. Sakina on that night, she made the order towards Imam Ali alayhi salatu wa salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her victory in a small, cold, damp cell. Well, she cried out out of grief. But because she knew that death was not the end of everything, but it was the beginning of life for the loss of Hanu wa Ta'ala in bliss. Before she died, she said, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum ya Abna Rasulullah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiyun. Ya Allah, we pray that you allow us to be like those who make the honor towards the Masumim of Ahlul Bayt that you allow us to make their example our example, that you make us of those who have an intimate relationship with them so that when we fall into our hard times that we'll be able to do what they did to become successful. We pray all of this be Haqqi Muhammadin alayhi wa ta'ala. We close out the majlis with the Surah Al-Fatiha, but before that, the loudest of salawat.